Welcome to Slate School and our conversation about education with Erica Christakis. Slate School is committed to excellence in education and we are delighted to present the Education Ideal Lab, which is a new, unique virtual series that is free and open to the public. This thought leading event convenes leaders, change makers, and participants from all sectors of education and innovation. Thank you so much for joining us. We are thrilled to have all of you with us here today. My name is Julie Mountcastle and I'm the head of school at Slate School. And I'll briefly introduce you to our school and then we'll get started with our amazing guest. Slate School is an independent 501c3 nonprofit elementary school where education is focused on cultivating creativity, fostering ingenuity, and inspiring a deep passion for lifelong learning. At Slate School, we have formed a community that is constantly striving to improve practice, to create meaningful educational experiences for learners of all ages, and to change the landscape in education. Slate School convenes experts for important, authentic conversations about education, and these online dialogues, like today's, are free and open to the public. We're so delighted to have all of you with us today, and we once again have learners joining us from six continents. So I'd like to begin by introducing our esteemed guest. Erica Christakis is an early childhood educator and New York Times bestselling author of The Importance of Being Little, What Young Children Really Need from Grownups. A former preschool director and faculty member of the Yale Study, Child Study Center, Erica holds teaching licensure in Massachusetts and Vermont and serves on the National Advisory Board of Defending the Early Years, a nonprofit working to provide quality education to all children. For two years, she wrote a Time.com Ideas column and her work has been featured in a number of other venues, including The Atlantic, The Washington Post, The Boston Globe, CNN.com and Salon. Erica is a graduate of Harvard College with a master's, de with master's degrees in education and public health. And I know a lot of people's idol. <laughs> so welcome, Erica. Thank you so much for coming to Slate School today. Thank you so much for arranging this virtual meetup. I'm very excited. Thank you. So let's jump right on it. We, we've, we've received lots of questions from lots of colleagues and, and other people. Uh, and um, I know we all have a lot of questions for you, so let's just get started. Sure. Okay, so, great. Um, so, you know, you have you've so eloquently discussed um, the shortfalls of of standardized projects and and processes like the the now famous Turkey Art Project, um, and I, and I guess we're wondering how this lens can help educators to see um, the value or the lack thereof in, in sort of one size fits all worksheets and workbook activities and boxed curricula that seem to be so prevalent today. Well, I think it's true that that sort of one size fits all model has been the standard for some time now in early education, although it certainly wasn't the case. I mean, we've gone through waves, I think, of sort of um, more or less child-centered versus teacher-directed approaches. And right now, I would say nationally, we're definitely more in the kind of teacher directed mode. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that, that you can't have a responsive classroom, but it certainly makes it more challenging, I think, if you're operating from the perspective of you know, what's right for the teacher rather than what's really right for the child. Um, and I think you know, we're starting to see more and more educators really looking to ways to be more responsive to children. But it is a process and every school, every teacher I've ever met, every family, every person who's really interested in educators, policymakers, they will all tell you honestly that it really is a process of learning for everyone to get to the point where you're really willing to take the risks that are necessary in order to teach and learn in a truly responsive way. It's not... Um, you know, it's not just about creating beautiful materials or creating a lovely playground. It's really a deeper process of learning to observe and listen to children. And I think that's the part, rather than some of the bells and whistles that can look so appealing. Uh, not that there isn't anything fabulous about a beautiful playground. You know, that's, those things are important too, but it's really that deeper process of slowing down 
um, trusting relationships, trusting children to tell us what they need. I think that we almost have to relearn that ourselves because most of us don't remember being young children. And so we kind of have to learn this at second hand in a sense through observation um, and honesty. And it, you know, it's really hard. I think it's really, really hard. And it's, it's almost impossible to do in a vacuum. So you need colleagues, you need um, leaders, people who will give educators that trust and that freedom. Yes. To yes. Explore and yeah, it, 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 you know, you said to take risks and I really do think that um, it, it requires that it requires some bravery because I think as a teacher, you, you have to be confident in what you know so that you can be confident that as you observe children in ways that might not be standardized, you'll see what you need to see from them. You know, teachers That's are, right. we're always assessing, right? We're always looking at, okay, but, but now what am I gonna give little Bobby next? So he, he moves along and, you know, in his personal trajectory. Um, but, you know, it strikes me that that's a hard lesson for young teachers. I don't, I, you know, I mean, I, I don't envy the, the job of the college professors preparing teachers to go into the world because I think that is a really hard um, quality to teach people. And I, I wonder, you know, for those, those teachers who are worried about classroom management, who are worried about, you know, losing control with kids later, how, you know, uh, what can you say to them to sort of encourage them and give them confidence that this kind of stepping back and letting the child lead actually, you know, it, it, it won't destroy your classroom management, it, it, will, it actually will improve it. Well, I think one thing that's helpful for educators, especially new educators to keep in mind is what the evidence base tells us, what the research tells us. And what we know from um, a lot of decades of research on quality early childhood classrooms is that there are two features basically that make for a supportive environment, two broad features. Um, one is knowledge of child development. And the other is knowledge of individual children. So in a way, we're talking about two sort of sets of interlocking um, knowledge bases. You know, what does, what does a generic three-year-old look like? It's really important to know the difference between what a typically developing child at three looks like versus six. Um, understanding that there's huge variation and development is not linear, but it's really important that educators have a solid basis in human development because otherwise you're really just kind of um, working in the dark. But the other factor that is really quantifiable is that we have to know individual children. And when you have these two pieces, when you're in relationship with children and you have that sort of meta awareness of, you know, actually it doesn't really make sense to expect my 18 month olds um, in the child care center to be participating in a large group morning meeting every day, you know, because developmentally that's inappropriate for probably 99% of 18 month olds. So, you know, when you have that developmental base, then you can start to be in relationship with children with more success uh, because you don't have to be doing guesswork all the time. You know, you can kind of say, oh, that's right. I remember that four-year-olds are learning, you know, they're concrete thinkers. They're not typically very abstract thinkers. So if that makes sense, you know, that's sort of how I view it. So in terms of getting back to your question about how to encourage educators, I would say, first of all, you know, really know, um, really get grounded in some of the principles of child development, because that's very freeing. And then find ways to cultivate um, relationships, you know, not only with children, but with their families. And, and that can, I don't, I don't want to maybe say too much about this right now, so stop me if I'm getting carried away. But when you know children and their families, then you can really adjust your curriculum so that you're not just, um, oh, it's November, let's get out our hand and trace the Thanksgiving turkey, you know, and stick little um, bright colored fluorescent feathers on it and send everyone home. You know, this poor turkey I give a lot of um, grief to, but you know, that's sort of emblematic of that cookie cutter, if you will, way of thinking about child development. So I think that, um, you know, when we encourage teachers to understand the developing mind, the developing child, and also to really get in relationship with families. Now, it's easier said than done on both fronts, um, no question, but those are kind of the essential ingredients. And it turns out that those are actually more important in terms of quality outcomes 
in educational settings, then some of the things we assume are really important, like classroom size, teacher um, child ratios, it's, it's at, those are actually less meaningful um, you know, in terms of what we've been able to see in the research literature than actually these relationships and knowledge. So fascinating. I was just, not, I was just sitting here nodding. I'm, I'm probably going to get tired of nodding. But, um, you know, I was thinking about this relationship with the child's first teachers as you were talking. And I thought, you know, it is funny in, in this very complicated and, and, you know, troubling time that um, we are developing relationships with families even more deeply than we did before. And it's out of necessity. And, you know, sometimes it's parents saying, help me, I need, you know, I don't know how to do what I'm doing right now. Or um, just, you know, here's what Tommy's doing today. I hope it's okay. You know, whatever it is, this relationship between home and school, I think, is becoming much more solid. Um, and so if, if, there are, if there are some positives in this difficult time, I, I, I'm, always, I'm always on the lookout for them. Right. And I would right. say that's one of them. I mean, never before have I looked into the homes of each of my children during morning meeting and, you know, seen what they're having for breakfast and, and see, you know, and, their brothers and sisters bopping around. And in a way, that's a little bit of a throwback to kind of the old way that, uh, you know, if you go back to books like the Laura Ingalls Wilder series where the teachers would live in with their families. And I actually, unbelievably, I, as a, as a first grader in 1969, you know, I, uh, my teacher lived with us for six months, no. uh, you know, which is just so unfathomable now. Uh, I don't even remember the circumstances. I think she was about to move and get married and she needed a place to live and she lived in my house. For, for half of my school year, um, you know, which now when you think about liability and boundaries and all of these things that, you know, have their role for sure. But um, I do think there is this window of opportunity right now. Now that said, there are of course many children who we aren't observing and we worry about those kids a lot, I think. Um, but I do think that there's a sort of um, maybe a, a way of breaking down barriers. It, now, some schools still do, very few, but some schools do occasional home visits at the beginning of the year and things like that, which I think, yes. is that what you do at Slate we School? Do. We yeah. do. I, you know, this school that I have great fondness for, the Lincoln Nursery School in Massachusetts, they, they really hold, to hold on to that model of establishing the year by making this connection and the teachers do these home visits. And I'm so glad to hear that you do that as well. But um, yeah, it is, it is an opportunity for children and, and parent, uh, parents and teachers, I think, to develop um, some empathy for each other, you know, yeah. to see, wow, I'm looking into your house and it's messy and beautiful and chaotic and structured and isn't that tough <laughs> and beautiful and, you know, that's all very human and, and it's great for us to model that for children too, that because of course kids don't learn in, in silos. Um, you know, we, we separate school and home, but from a child's perspective, it's not so separate. So I think that is positive where we have these opportunities to um, observe and, and support families. But uh, unfortunately, you know, many kids right now in the, in the shutdown are, um, they're sort of on their own. And that's very worrisome, I think, for, yes. for many of us. Yes. And I think it's also, you know, I, I think we're also asking families to, to, to understand all of this pedagogy overnight. Right, right. You know, I mean, while they're working. Try, right, and while they're working. Well, while they're yeah. trying to do their job over here, right, then they're trying to teach their children. And it's, it's, it's an enormous, it's an enormous ask. And I, I, think, um, I think one thing that is hard for me was hard for me as a parent even with my child and I, I was, I was never, I never thought that I was talented enough to teach my own child. You know, I never thought that I could do it. I always had great respect for my own children's teachers and so such love for them. Um, but uh, I, I think one of the reasons it's hard, it, I thought it would be hard for me is that my lens of what was successful for a child, for my child, I thought was clouded. I thought it yeah. was complicated for me not to sort of give them, you know, in ways that I didn't even know I was giving them subtly, subtle cues. Um, what I thought was the answer to the the answer to the work they were doing, and I just I I think it's really challenging to to abandon that to say goodbye to your own idea of success in favor of completely giving over to the child's idea of success. 
And I love that in the classroom. I see such great um, response from that. Um, yeah. But how, how, do, how, how can you explain that to people who might not be familiar with that kind of work? Of the sort of surrendering to the child's pacing and, and yeah, I mean, I think it again, it takes practice, it takes buy in from a community. Um, you know, I think, for example, to give it to to give something um, a sort of a concrete picture of this, um, there are teachers who start the school year with empty walls and really almost nothing in the classroom, and the message is that we're gonna build this together and we're not going to presume that children need little borders with apples and leaves on them. And, you know, all of these things that we sort of are cued to think of as, um, you know, things that denote schooling. We're gonna wait and we're gonna see what this group of kids can do, what they're interested in. But it actually does take some courage to open up your school on day one and it looks like, you know, as I said, and at some point, it looks like a Greyhound, you know, bus depot <laughs> and, and not, um, you know, this cheery, bright, primary color kind of space that many of us are cued, especially the adults, to think of as not only educational, but, but nurturing. You know, it's a sign of love and care that your teacher sets up, sets up the classroom. So it does take courage, but I also think it takes community. You know, you can't really do this. There are very fierce, courageous teachers who, who carve out the space to do this in their own way. But usually it requires leadership, I think, and good communication, and also um, a slow process, you know, where you might experiment. Um, or let's take another example, moving from a canned curriculum where you have an idea on Monday, October 21st, that you're going to get out pumpkins and, you know, and even if a child is, having a major problem in their lives, you know, death of a grandparent or even a happy event that's stressful like the birth of a child or maybe you have a homeless child in your classroom or an English language learner, you know, who has no concept of why pumpkins have any meaning in our culture. Um, you know, you've got your, your, your schedule and that's what you're sticking to. Now that's really hard in a system that doesn't allow you to have that flexibility, but there are ways or processes, which you know very well, to, uh, you know, make subtle changes. Um, you know, maybe you set up a loose parts uh, studio in your classroom and you have a designated time of the day where kids can go and make something and the something isn't, you know, it's, it's more inquiry based. Like, what do we need to do to answer a question rather than, oh, let's go make dinosaurs. Um, so you can make these changes, but they take a lot of effort and a lot of time. And so I don't want to discourage um, teachers, you know, who see, I, I talk to a lot of teachers who sense that something is really amiss, you know, and they see the pacing and the scheduling and the moving every 15 or 20 minutes and wiping down the tables and bringing out the supplies and, okay, we're going to make our collage. We're going to, and, and I have taught this way too. I mean, I, I think we all have, um, it's really hard to, they, they sense that something is not really right, but they don't quite know how to, how to alter it. And, you know, I think starting small and asking for help um, and, and talking, getting in dialogue with other teachers, uh, colleagues, parents, what are you seeing? Um, and maybe designating a day of the week or, or a time of day where you just kind of stop expecting things and just watch and see what happens, that can be very helpful. But it's messy and scary too, so um, it it takes it takes time. I think that's the one message I've heard over and over again in successful programs that it took years actually to develop the relationships and the confidence to really listen to children and be responsive to them. You know, it, and and you mentioned sort of the canned curricula, and and there are elements of all of those boxes of teaching that are so good. There are right. beautiful ideas in there, well thought out. But I think, you know, we run into the problem when we say, you know, okay, everybody's going to be on page 24 today. Everybody's going to be on page 28 on Thursday. And, and we sort of hold ourselves to a schedule that's false. Um, right. You know, you've talked, a lot of, uh, you've talked a lot about the pace of children and how sometimes we misinterpret that. 
Yeah, I think we do, uh, actually. I, you know, I've been really interested in some of the labels, the diagnostic labels that we use with children. Um, of course, ADHD is an obvious one, but, you know, things like slow cognitive tempo disorder and some other things that really, um, you know, I'm not saying they're not legitimate. You know, there may be some basis of reality there, but it's interesting that a lot of adult um, concern about children has to do with tempo and pacing and our expectations for how and when children do things. Um, and I think that does bear some questioning. You know, there was this incredible study that came out a year or two ago, um, looking at children with uh, attention deficit disorder. And they did a study where they looked at the cutoff date for kindergarten. And, you know, they found that children who just missed the cutoff, or I'm sorry, yeah, no, who, let me see if I can get this straight. The children who were young, basically, by just a month, had something like you know 30 or 40 percent greater chance of being diagnosed with ADHD than the, than the kids who were effectively only you know a week older, two weeks older, um, and that really tells you that there's something not just sort of objectively clinical about what we're observing, but rather our expectations for children. And if it really is the case that just being a couple weeks older, you suddenly get sort of a lot more freedom to be who you are. Um, I think that's pretty sobering. So yeah, the pacing is, you know, and of course all of us are moving faster. And, you know, maybe maybe one of the few silver linings of this um, coronavirus shutdown is that, you know, most of us are having to slow down. Um, even those of us, you know, who have a lot of demands on our time, you know, there's just this reality that we can't move as quickly as we would like. And maybe there will be an opportunity to reflect on that and sort of, um, see what we can take from that, you know, when we do get back to life. Well, we'll probably never get back to life as we knew it, but the new normal, I hope, will include some reckoning and some sort of reflection on the pacing of children's lives. Because I think we're, we're, we're really getting to the point where we're seeing um, really diminishing returns. I mean, there are only so many hours in the day and children are telling us from their um, behavior their behavioral dysregulation, which is certainly something that if you talk to any teacher around the country, they will say that they see more and more um, stress. And we see this with diagnoses of um, mental health problems in children and adverse childhood events that are experiences that are growing. And, you know, we, we need to listen to kids and slow down. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's interesting, you know, you mentioned the, the, the example of, you know, one or two weeks difference, but we forget what, what fractional part of the entire time they've been living that is, you know, to us right. so for two is, you know, <laughs> right now I'm thinking it's very small. Right, right, right. <laughs> Compared to how old I am. But uh, for them, you know, they, they've not been on this planet that long and a week is still oh, a long time. Funny. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. No, I was gonna say, it's always funny when little kids will say, when I was little, <laughs> they'll say very earnestly, you know, when I was little and they're maybe six years old and they're talking about when they were five. But you're right. It's a really small fraction of their lives. And that's worth remembering, too. Yeah. So um, I, I know that I am incredibly lucky here at Slate School. And I have a beautiful campus with um, lots of room for kids to roam. Right. And not everybody has that. No. Uh, and, it, and in fact, you know, I think sometimes about ways that we can help, you know, places, you know, that, to have some more of this, this green space, whatever it looks like, or how we can make that for others. But um, here, uh, we are able to go outside. And um, whenever I, I see um, and I, I've, I've talked to my colleagues about this, you know, whenever things seem to be just a little bit funny, little things aren't, aren't, aren't doesn't feel smooth, the kids are, you know, maybe a little bit less focused or a little bit less themselves, I think actually is what it is, a little bit less themselves. Right. Um, going outside makes such a difference for us. And I'm wondering um, how what you think about the role of nature in helping kids kind of find their own personal pace? Well, it's a great question. And it's such a topical one now, I think, particularly, you know, as we're seeing the effects of, um, well, the importance of nature in our lives. And, um, you know, there's a huge body of research right now that really 
it's indisputable that being in nature is helpful. People in hospitals heal more quickly when they have a plant in their room or they have a window view. Um, you know, it's just, I mean, mental health is improved. And it's, what's interesting to me is that a lot of adults have bought into this to some extent for their own lives. And yet it hasn't really translated uniformly across um, schooling in the United States. And I think you see pockets of effort to really, really bring nature into the classroom and, and even better to get kids outside to the extent that they can. Uh, but it's certainly not uniform and there are a lot of barriers to it. Um, I do think that one of the unintended effects of coronavirus will be that it's going to be very important for children to be outdoors when we start reopening schools. And I hope that teachers will start realizing that there are many things you can do outside that might not seem like recess or PE or nature walk time. But you know, you can do math outside, you can do science, you can read stories outside. Really, I can't think of, I mean, there's almost nothing I can think of that you couldn't do from a pedagogic point of view outdoors. Um, you know, even in harsh climates, it's usually not the children who are objecting to being outside. And I speak from experience because I'm a native New Englander, you know, but um, it, it's really the adults who have the hangups about being outside, um, you know, and again, that gets back to pacing and to schedules because um, if you do live in, in a climate where there's inclement weather, uh, you know, you have to sort of think about how to go with the flow so that kids can be outside as much as possible without constantly coming in and out. And, um, you know, when I was in Finland, I saw, I went to visit a preschool that had this giant room that was, the whole room was a, a dryer. It was like a clothes dryer room. I don't know, they, they called it like an earring cupboard, but it really- wow. Yeah, and so they just put everything in there and then 10 minutes later it was dry. But, you know, most of us don't have that luxury. So we have to think about how to do it. But I think the barriers are more in the adult headspace than with children. Um, and, you know, it, they, they are serious barriers. I mean, I'm not trying to discount them. It, it's really hard to figure out ways, especially in, um, in, in tough climates or in urban areas where there's not a lot of outdoor space. But I think, you know, let me just say one thing about nature, which may seem obvious, but I, I want to say it anyway. What I love about children in nature is that you know, nature has its own pace and you really can't speed it up. And it's often a really slow pace. Um, and, and so I think there's a natural kind of sympathy between natural elements and, ch and childhood and human development. Um, and I always like to think about the way that, you know, children are literally quite low to the ground compared to adults. And so they are observing things that are often slow and tiny um, that we don't even notice. You know, I'm thinking obviously of insects, um, yeah, yeah. but you know, flowers and blades of grass. And, you know, even like if you're walking on a city sidewalk, you know, the things that grow in the cracks in the sidewalk and all of these things. And, and there's a pacing um, that comes from nature that really does regulate us. You know, our heartbeat, um, our thoughts, it, it slows us down. And so I think that there's a reason why there's so many scientific studies showing the benefits of nature. There's a great video that some of your viewers might want to see called Schools Out. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I don't um, know. It's Oh, it's so amazing. And what's great is it's only about 30 minutes long. It's not a long thing, but it's a nature-based um, kindergarten in, now I'm forgetting, it's either Germany or Switzerland, but it's in a sort of central northern European country. And it's a really full-on nature classroom. I mean, it's not like just on certain days, it, everything, <laughs> including their bathroom is outside, everything. Wow. Um, and and yeah. it shows the, sort of the arc of this school year outside and the risks that the children are taking and the calculated risks that the adults are taking and the parents, they're overcoming their fears um, of watching children learning to build fires and, you know, actually having some um, light supervision, you know, which was really shocking to me as an American educator to see there was, I think there's a line in the video where the teacher says, you know, we were able to see most of the kids most of the time or something like that. And the, whoo! Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. But anyway, it's a really interesting, um, you know, just a beautiful sort of illustration of what a nature based education can look like. Oh, that's great. I will I definitely check that out. We can take pieces of that, even if we can't do it all ourselves. Right, 
right. I, I always, when I take families on the tour of our school, I, we, we get to what we call the backyard, which is actually the front yard, but please don't ask me about that. I, I, I confused it from the beginning, so that's how we kept it. But um, we, let, we let the students who are in the school design a playscape. Uh -huh. And they did it in, indoors with, you know, big tubes and landscape architect and our architect and they taped things together in a diff, you know, two different configurations and, and photographed it. And then that was sent to the fabricator and yeah. he made some decisions and then came and, and, and brought what looks very much like their photograph here. And it's so funny because what you say about risk, there's risk inherent in the new playscape. Sure. And um, what I love about it as, a, as an educator is that I watch them figure out what they are capable of. No, I need, I'm not ready for that yet. And so they, back, they step back away. And, or I, I can do this now. Or look at that, I can have three, I, I can have three points touching. So I can, I can try this. And I think it's so valuable. And um, I think it's been missing right. for a while. Well, and you know, I think, that, you know, it's interesting that you talk about kids sort of knowing themselves because when we give them a scaffolding, you know, you can't just throw a child into the deep end of a pool. I mean, that's not how kids learn to swim, I hope. Um, but although some people claim that's how they learn to swim, but I, I don't know. Anyway, metaphorically speaking, you know, you have to give children sort of staged um, risk opportunities. And I think when we do that, then we see that kids actually do sort of know their limits. And sometimes when they're fearful or they're overconfident, that's where the knowledge of child development and the knowledge of the individual child comes in because you know when to exert pressure, when to back off, when to guide, when to let the child be free. Um, and you know that takes time and competence and support and all of those things. But um, I think that's the beauty of a, a learning environment that's really in tune and sort of humming along that kids can learn to really test themselves. Um, and I think a lot of children who grow up, um, you know, I, I don't want to come down too heavily on screen time because it's such a cliche. It's like low hanging fruit. But, you know, one of the real problems with excess screen time is, of course, that it cuts into the time that kids could be doing other things. And, you know, as innovative as some video games are, and I, I don't discount that some of them really are quite clever, but, you know, that physical risk taking and that um, confidence that comes from really testing yourself physically, that, that is an iterative process. You know, you don't just wake up one day and go out and walk on stilts, you know, right? I mean, you really have to develop those gross motor skills over time. And there's a psychological piece too of the confidence and the, um, the courage, I guess. And so, yeah, yeah it's, you're right. You're, you're, I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's, I know, I know the, the screen time piece is, is, is easy, but it's interesting right now because we're, we're dependent on that. Right. Right. And, um, you know, I, I, I've said to, you know, so to, to some people, it's, it's completely ironic, um, that a, a school like ours is very, you know, low tech. We don't have a lot of screens in our school. We don't use a lot of technology. Um, we we occasionally put something on a screen, but we, we see it as a window to wonder, yeah. not as an answer to a question, you know, yeah. something that makes us wonder more. Um, but uh, I wonder, you know, as this is ending, as this, as we put this behind us, how will we bring kids back from the pace of video? the pace of things changing so quickly on the screen. And that, I, I think it's, it's so seductive. It is terribly seductive. My, uh, my brother-in-law, Dimitri Christakis, is a big expert on, um, on media and children. And he's done studies showing, you know, just exactly what you said, like the frenetic pacing of video. It really, um, it, it really kind of rewires the brain and it leads um, it leads us to ex have certain expectations about pacing. And, and so then when we see, I mean, he talks about how if you see these quick edits, these jumps mm -hmm. in videos, then you don't understand that a farm animal walks from the barn to the pasture. You know, you just think, oh, it leaps. <laughs> you, yeah, know, right, right. you don't have a sense of what reality looks like. So that is really a concern, I think, especially with very young kids who don't have much of a reality base yet. Um, but I think, you know, I, I try to, like you, I, I like your phrasing about the, um, 
using it as a, what did you say, a window? Window to, to wonder. Yeah. Window to wonder. I don't have anything so poetic, but I think when technology can be used to serve our human needs, um, for example, you know, FaceTime with a grandparent, that's very different. Or, or you know, I mean, there are many, many examples. Um, I think that's very different than just, you know, using it as a default because we don't know what else to do. Um, now that said, I'm very sympathetic to families right now. You know, we're in an unusual situation, especially with parents who have really demanding jobs and they just don't know what to do with their kids. You know, I, I think we all have to give ourselves a break and, and show empathy. But I, again, I think there's an opportunity when we do get back um, to really try to get back to the importance of relationships. And, and that's what I've seen in schools like the Slate School. And again, I was talking about Lincoln Nursery School in Massachusetts and obviously countless others. The ones that are using technology effectively right now are using it to foster relationship. You know, whether it's offering some kind of uh, question or provocation or, or having a one-on-one -on -one check in or a small group. And I think the other thing is that a lot of these opportunities are optional you know, which schools really struggle with. They don't want to make it optional. But I think if we're really being responsive, we do need to kind of look at individual families and see what can they handle and what can individual kids handle. For a lot of children, Zoom, Zoom sessions are very dysregulating and are not helpful. But for other kids, you know, it's a real window into their social experience. Um, so yeah, the, I mean, we could talk about screen time all day, I'm sure. Probably on our screens. Yeah, on our screens, I know. But, but I'm really curious, and I'm, I'm hopeful, but I'm also a little nervous about what is really going to change and what's not going to change. I, my concern about what we're seeing now um, during this shutdown, I, I think we're um, seeing extremes that we already see in education. I think we're amplifying them. So I think the children and families and educators who already are able to... Um, give their children open-ended play and to have deep responsive conversations. You know, those families are probably doing pretty well right now. You know, uh, kids who are read to or have books in their homes, but it's the children who don't have those experiences or the families that don't really maybe have the opportunity to see the value. We're just gonna see more and more of a divide. And, and I really hope educators will step up to the plate and, and try to find some new ways to close that divide. Yeah, I think, um, I think we can be sure that when we come back to school, um, there are gonna be such interesting gaps and growths. Yes, yes. I well, mean, I don't think we will ever in our lives, in our careers, and I, I hope this doesn't happen again, see um, such diversity of, right. of, of growing and maybe plateauing. Yeah, and it's it's going to make for a very very interesting first few months of school, and and I think even within individual children, we're going to see those, uh, you know, absolutely, and that diversity, you know, within individual children's sort of learning profiles, and and I think it's going to be really challenging to the adult expectations that, you know, this is what a fifth grader looks like. This is what a first grader looks like. This is what we, you know, we hear a lot about kindergarten readiness, which is a concept that really makes me berserk because, um, you know, kindergarten used to be the gateway into school. There was no, there was no sort of gate that you had to unlock. I mean, it was right. welcome to kindergarten. And now we have this notion that kids are not prepared. Well, there are gonna be a lot of children who, um, are going to need flexibility and understanding, and and you're right. There there will be opportunities for growth too. I mean, I think we shouldn't discount that the the courage and the bravery and the independence that children will be learning now. Um, and you know, one of the ways kids learn, I talk a lot about play, and I think that's because I'm a a product of my environment. You know, I'm an educated person. I'm an American teacher. So for me, play is sort of where it's at. But, you know, many children around the world learn not only from play, but through observing adults and from working side by side with adults. Um, and that's something that I've actually been critiqued about that I've failed to understand that, you know, children don't only learn through play. They, they learn from watching adults and there's something really valuable about that too. And so I think a lot of kids are going to come back with, like you said, they're going to have some real gaps. Um, 
And some of the children who are, you know, from privileged environments are going to be soaring. Others will be really stressed emotionally. We don't know what we're going to see. That's but it. we should also be open-minded. You know, maybe these kids are not going to have figured out um, fractions, you know, or whatever the learning learning goals were. Um, but they may really have some resilience uh, and they may have a window into the adult world, whether we like it or not, right. you know, they're going to, they're going to learn other things. And yeah, so absolutely. I, I, I'm, I, I keep kind of returning my own thinking to not just do not devalue the learning that's happening because right. I, I've said to my students and I, I say to anybody who will listen, you know, school is happening everywhere. Right. Just, it, school is not the building. If you're on a school bus, the school bus is school. If you're at home, home is school. You're always learning. You're not ever turned off to that. Right. And and so I, you know, I think the, the challenge will be to just fully value all of the things that children have learned while they're away. Right. And that I guess gets back to relationships. I think you know, and it's, I mean, I, I'm sounding a little bit like a one trick pony here, but, you know, I do think relationships are this central feature of human learning. And we know that from so many studies of the brain, um, you know, there's this amazing study that was done out in Seattle a few years ago where I think it was 10 month old babies. Did you hear about this study? Where yes. they were Mandarin and, you know, one, the control group was in one setting in a, in a lab and they learned it by video. And then the other group learned it with the human, but everything else was the same. It was the same teacher, it was the same lesson. And of course you're nodding, but um, you know, the punchline is that the babies who learned from a human actually were able to um, discriminate the, the little units of sound in Mandarin. And the babies who watched the screen learned, you know, zilch. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's pretty powerful, I think. It is, it is, <laughs> it is. Yeah. It's confirmation that um, we're, I think we're not going to outsource ourselves. As, as no, I don't think so. Parents. You know, I, initially when this first started happening, I was thinking like this, I, I won't say I thought that teachers would be obsolete or anything like that, because I certainly didn't. But I was really curious sort of what would we glean from this? Um, and, and I think honestly, it's just not rocket science. science. I mean, what we're gleaning is that, you know, you can... Uh, especially with older kids, I, I do think older kids can learn from screen time, you know, things mm -hmm. like Khan Academy or whatever math lessons. I mean, fine, but that the quality of the relationships, you know, knowing and being known, that is um, kind of that's how the human brain evolved to to learn. And I, I always say that the most efficient uh, early literacy program is conversation. Yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. that 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 is really where it's at. You know, if you're listening and talking with a young child, um, that is a lot more efficient than doing, you know, those old letter of the day kind of programs. I know. We have, Probably. But yeah. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, it's, it's funny to me to laugh at that because I'm a product of that. Of course. Yeah. And, and we all, uh, many of us are, most of us, you know, and, and, and yet I do think we have a better idea now. I, I think that um, when I was, we were first talking about sort of the the challenges of, of children sort of emotionally over this time and when they return. And I've been thinking um, about, you know, social emotional curriculum. Right. And, you know, th there are good ideas out there. Right. Um, but I mean, I, I don't want to say too much about what I think, but I will say that when we systematize things, I think it gets challenging. Yeah. And, and yes, yeah, no, I would agree with you. I think that they, those curricula come from a place of um, real, you know, good intention. Yes. And, yeah. but, you know, the research shows that those programs, when they kind of are dropped in, you know, your 30 minutes per week where you sit down and you read a story and then you talk in circle time about, you know, how to be nice or how to listen, that actually has very little effect. But when those programs are really integrated into a culture where the whole school, you know, not just the teacher and the child, but where everyone is in relationship and when there are certain values that are really lived and communicated to families, then those add-on programs, you know, they, they won't hurt and some, some of them can help and some of them don't. But, um, but, you know, there's no question that if you, if you read a book that imparts a certain lesson, you know, it's not going to really land with a lot of authenticity if there isn't the context for it. Right. For sure. So, 
uh, you know, that's sort of teaching social emotional skills at second hand. And really there's an argument that the best way to teach that is through letting children live and be in the world um, with, with adult scaffolding where you help them to reflect and understand. And one thing I think is really useful is having a shared language mm -hmm. around um, communication, around how to talk to each other, how to listen. You know, so classrooms where everybody knows sort of what the routine is um, mm -hmm. and when there's a problem, you know, how you approach it. And, you know, sometimes they have shared words or procedures. I mean, I think that's all good. Um, yes. But because we're all creatures of habit and we like patterns and, you know, that's all good. But when it's, when it has a kind of phony element to it, I mean, kids are not stupid. No. You know, they know when someone really cares about them and they know, <laughs> they know how to learn. So if they're seeing living models, that's more effective, I think, than again, that sort of canned curriculum. But I will say that I appreciate teachers who are starting with anything, you know, and if the canned curriculum gives you a chance without having to do a lot of thought to just start reflecting, then that's great, you know, but just be careful that that canned curriculum is not taking away from free play time or recess time or things like that. That's, that's always the trade-off. And I think also if it takes away from, um, I want to I want to say this exactly as I mean it. If it takes away from the adult authentically sharing who they are, right? The child, right. Sometimes I think in in the social emotional packages, there's such good stuff there that it's tempting to sort of push down who you are, right? And right. I think I think children have such a uh, radar for that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, if you're not being who, true to yourself, then I, it's very difficult. Then when you're saying, "Listen, little Tommy, I want you to be your your unique self," you go and do that. And I think it's it falls on deaf ears because right. they recognize the you know, the double standard there. You right. have to be real with them. I mean, I think that a good rule of thumb is to, you know to be yourself and to bring what you have. You know, obviously we need to regulate ourselves and model model that if we're having a bad day. You know, it's we, we learn how to communicate that in, in, in ways that are appropriate. But, um, you know, I think approaching children with playfulness and with curiosity and empathy and, um, you know, that is really where the action is, I think, emotional connection. And if you think about how we all learn, um, you know, we often are not really very persuadable. Uh, we're not, as a species, very good at being reassured. Those are cognitive actions. Um, and if you've ever tried to change the mind of someone with a different political point of view, it's amazing how the more you throw data at someone, it, I mean, this has been studied, you know, people actually get more entrenched. Um, and so I think of that a lot with children, that sometimes we go straight to the sort of cognitive response and we try to reassure a child who's crying or anxious. We try to persuade them, oh, you know, it's okay, you'll be all right. You know, actually, you know, the monster isn't really under your bed. And in some ways, connecting emotionally on an affective level is so much more effective. Like saying, um, oh my goodness, I hate it when I get that feeling. That is such a scary feeling, isn't it? Yeah. Oh. You know, when I, when I used to worry about monsters under my bed, it really helped me if my mom gave me a hug. Could I give you a hug right now? You know, that sort of... Um, Sorry for the little awkward role play. But that was fantastic, actually. I feel you. Meeting the child emotionally, it, then you're not, you're not trying to own the problem. You're actually, you're just showing empathy and curiosity about their thoughts. And that's, I think, and I've learned this, you know, I, I'm, well, I won't tell you how old I am. I think I already revealed it. I'm in my late 50s. <laughs> I think we're the same age, actually. <laughs> anyway, you know, it took me decades to realize that, using the cognitive approach, trying to persuade people and reassure them, it, it makes everyone nuts. You know, yeah. actually it's just that, that sort of joining, you know, and often playfulness and empathy and, and the curiosity too. like, tell me about your thoughts. Like, what are you thinking? Um, it, it doesn't work. It, it, it doesn't only work with kids. I find it's very effective. <laughs> um, with my husband, for example. <laughs> so <laughs> that's great. And it buys time too, you know, because we always think as teachers that we have to have the answers. And I think parents feel that too. Um, but if you just say, um, I learned this trick actually when I was working with a child with trauma, you know, thank you for telling me that. You know, when you, when you just, you buy yourself some time, like, huh, thank you. You know, even if they're having a tantrum, thank you for showing me 
that you're really upset right now. Now I see what I need to do. Thanks. <laughs> right, right. And I think I don't know. I don't know is such a powerful thing to say to kids. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when they, when they're, you know, looking to you to, you know, you know what, I don't exactly know, but I thought we could figure this out together. Right. Right. Because, you know, I think it's a, I think it's, you know, it's a false model for them to think that we always right. have all the answers just because we've lived longer. Right. I, I, I always say that I've learned the most valuable things I've ever learned from children. Yeah. Of course. So, you know, their, their wisdom is, you know, unobstructed right. by, by, you know, being dinged up by life's little, right, right, right. you know, it's, it's, so it's, it's much more alive for them. Yeah. Um, so you were, you were mentioning books before. And um, so at our school, we, we have a, we have a book policy and we actually say, you know, we, we, we want to protect children and we want to protect childhood. And so we say, we're not going to introduce a child to the unkindness of the world until they've experienced it themselves. And, um, we see children having a really beautiful trust and, and confidence in the world. Um, but as, as children progress through school, um, you know, texts must become more complex. We, we, right. want to share the, we want to share history with children. You know, we love talking about what happened in the past right here where we live. Um, but I think, I think it, it's a little bit of a trap to think that, you know, oh, you know, they're children, so we can talk about Ruby Bridges, or, you know, they're nine, so we can talk about Anne Frank. You know, I, I, I don't think, I think that those models are actually so scary for children. And, and I'm just wondering if you have a, have a thought about, you know, when children's thinking becomes elastic enough, flexible enough, not that black and white thinking, right. that they're able to sort of, um, absorb the bravery of the story right and not just the cruelty well you know so that's a really interesting question and the first thing i want to say is that i think there is a huge trend right now where fiction for young kids is getting more and more um complicated complex it's it's revealing to some extent the reality that we have a very diverse country many many children with adverse childhood experiences mm -hmm. you know, homeless children kids mm -hmm. with um, you know, I read recently that, and I find this really hard to believe, but it was something like 8% of children um, have, ha had, have, have had, I think it was the death of a parent, you know, which seemed really high to me. But, you know, maybe if you're including care, like primary caregiver, so it could be grandparent or, um, you know, so, so the, the, I, I just want to set the stage a little bit that many kids actually do experience these traumas. Yes. But, but I will say that um, there's no doubt, I mean, I am a real lover of children's literature and I am astounded by how sort of grim, particularly in the older elementary ages um, and in a school that I'm aware of in Vermont recently, uh, I noticed that they did a play about um, the history of child labor in Vermont. And th these were fourth graders doing a play about really grim subject matter, uh, poverty and child abuse and um, suicide. and. And, you know, I raised my kids, well, I have a huge age gap. I have a 10 year old, but I also have a 28 year old. And so I've, I've really seen this, um, yes. change, you know, in my own parenting. And there's no question that there's been a push down, like everything else in our society, there's been this push down to, um, you know, um, younger and younger ages of these complex topics. So I guess I would get back to um, being responsive to children and to really um, approaching them, like I said, with this, you know, playfulness and empathy and curiosity and acceptance. Um, and, you know, I think as a rule, it's, it's hard to make hard and fast rules, but I, I agree with you that, you know, you can make curricular decisions. Like we're not going to read a book um, for seven-year-olds about something that really might be hard for them to process in a school setting. But I wouldn't discount the importance of you know, when you're in relationship with children, they can process a lot. And a lot of the children that we see nowadays have had trauma, they've had tough experiences. And so, you know, I respect your decision very much, um, but I also would not assume necessarily that all of your student population hasn't had some of these tough experiences. And so then the question is, where is the appropriate venue for them to really um, 
handle it. Uh, I, I know a little child right now who's had a lot of child trauma. Um, and I was sort of reluctant to introduce him to the Harry Potter books beyond, you know, like book three, because I just thought it was getting too intense. Then I became aware that actually for him, it was a way to process his trauma. Wow. Yes. So to yeah. actually talk about death of beloved characters. You know, so it is complicated. But I think from a school perspective, it probably does make sense to err on the side of being gentler, especially given that, and I would love to talk to um, a publishing, a publisher or like a bookseller, like why is this trend? You know, are we responding to the experiences that we're seeing in our population of kids or is it yet another example of what I call adultification, which is kind of push down of, um, you know, really um, inappropriate content. You know, it's probably a combination of things. Right. I think it's the, what we value. What we value is good literature, right? Right. As adults, you know, right. must have all these complexities. I think, I, yeah. Go. You go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no. You. You. Trickiness of Zoom. I, I was going to say one other thing, which is that you know, there's also um, another argument which I've seen recently, uh, which is that old-fashioned literature is too dated. It's too, you know, often it's male protagonists. Um, there's sexism. Often it's you know, characters that are white children. And I've heard people say, let's not expose children to some of these classics. And I would also be cautious about that because I think it's super important to have uh, children have exposure to literature that reflects their own lives. Um, but I also think kids, you know, if, you, if you're in dialogue with children, you can say, oh, isn't this weird? I've noticed that this book it's all boy characters, you know, or right. it's all boy animals. Huh, I wonder why that author did that. And, you know, when I was little, that's what a lot of the books were like. But now, it, you know, even yes. four-year-olds can actually reflect yes. if you give them the chance to right. think about it. Yes. So, you know, I think there's a certain role that teachers can play in, in sort of scaffolding and processing and parents even more so. Yes. Um, I think you're right. And I think no, I think no policy can be so rigid. I think we can only, we can, we can only go astray if we say that these are the absolute parameters, no matter what happens, right. because, you know, you come to know your students, you right. don't know them immediately, even, even after the home visit, it takes right. time to know kids. But you know, what you're talking about with um, sort of introducing things in a developmentally appropriate way and that's where you really do need to look at the whole group and, and as well as the individual i think about this a lot and i wonder if you do with a lot of the discussion about climate change in classrooms because what i'm seeing more and more is that children are catastrophizing you know i get it it is a catastrophe but yeah. it's very much an adult created catastrophe and the solutions will require adult change and behavior and policy. And I struggle with like how much, how valuable is it to frighten children versus instilling them a love of nature, yes. a love of animals, a, like understanding how food, where food comes from. And, you know, what, like there's, it seems like we're kind of erring on the side of, again, I call it adultification. You know, we think that educating children about the world requires us to terrify them. Um, and I wonder if a better approach is to just really introduce children to the beauty of the natural world. Um, you know, and, and I'm sure there's a happy medium. I mean, kids love recycling. They love bossing their parents around and making sure that they're turning lights off and all that stuff. Right. Um, but, but I do see this kind of adult lens through which we're seeing the issue of climate change. I think we see it in things like, um, I mean, this is an extreme example, but the active shooter drills that are so common now in um, classrooms where, you know, we don't do this to adults when we go right. to restaurants and nursing homes, you know, we don't have like fire alarms and all these drills, but we do it with kids. And, right. and so it does seem like, you know, we, we need to get our priorities straight. I, I think you're right. Yeah. I think, you know, we love what we notice. Right. And if we can teach children to notice. Yeah. In nature. Yeah. Um, then I think that I think I think we go a lot further toward toward protecting our planet. Yeah, I hope you know, so. To see, a, to see a you know a six or seven year old understand the gentleness that's required to hold a woolly bear caterpillar right. um, is a changer not just for the child holding the caterpillar but for anybody who watches. It. Yes, yes, for sure. Uh, you know, and so I I think uh, I I think here we talk about how to take care of how to take care of the earth. 
you know, there's a there's a big ritual here every week with the compost. We compost all of our scraps. We have a we have the compost procession that takes the that takes all of the bits and and puts them in the compost bin to use for the garden. Right. But you know, we're not really talking about the, you know, what the what the other side of that might be. Right. Right. Yeah, that seems like a a, a developmentally appropriate <laughs> way to. to and it's fun. Yeah, and it's yeah. and it's fun. And we have like actually a clear container for the compost in the classroom. Oh, that's so awesome! It's unusually beautiful. Yeah, I, that is. I, yeah, it's it's actually a beautiful thing. So, what is what is refuse is also art. <laughs> I've never seen that. That is so interesting. I, I think it's a pretty. It's I don't even know if it's meant to be a compost bin. Yeah, but it's like a it's like a clear jug. What a I'll great. show you later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I, I know our time is almost up, but I, I do just I do just want to offer you a moment to 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 give maybe some encouragement and advice to all of us who are struggling as homeschool parents. Yeah. And I know that you homeschool your child, so this is this is normal for you. Well, well, I I mean yes and no. I, I'm yes. Uh, it, it's too long a story, but <laughs> we're just embarking on the homeschooling journey. And this has been a very tough introduction, I will say, because, you know, homeschooling is not, um, I hope, you know, staying inside your house and not going out and engaging. Right, exactly. The world. Go to the library. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, so I'm not a good person to um, give advice. I, I say that with, I hope, some humility. But I think if we get back to the power of relationships for learning and the idea that schooling and learning are, are you know, they, they can be different things. I mean, kids don't always learn at school and they often do most of their learning at home. I mean, you know, if you think about, as you were saying, that learning happens everywhere and that the fuel for learning is relationship, then I think that that's really powerful. Now, I would say to parents who are really struggling right now with time management and with their own jobs, and, and I have noticed this myself um, because my husband and I recently adopted this little boy um, at age nine. You know, so we had a long period of time where we did not have kids in the home. Um, and so I'm getting reacquainted with this idea of that energy where the kid, you know, grabs your face and they, like, if you turn away, they pull your face back. And I can't believe I just did that on Zoom. But you know what I'm saying? Like that where they just want your undivided attention. Um, so here's my little piece of advice these small bursts of attention where you absolutely give a hundred percent and you do not look at your phone you don't look away they don't have to be big bursts of time they really don't but if you can build a few of those into each day i think it you know it is fuel it's literally fuel you know and if you just drop everything in a very kind of ostentatious way you know your child comes over and instead of like, oh yeah, honey, uh-huh, oh cool, oh that's great, honey. You know, if you just like commit to dropping everything and give five minutes, 10 minutes, play a game or just listen or it, it's unbelievable. It's like a little flower that opens up, you know? And so my advice to parents who are struggling is it doesn't have to be a lot of time. I mean, it would be nice if it could be a lot of time, but if you can do that child directed play where you give a child a choice, like what do you wanna do right now? And just let them choose. Um, I think parents don't realize like how powerful those moments are, even if they, given how busy parents are right now, even if they have to be really brief moments, if you can just tune in, you know, I would say, honestly, in these circumstances, those, those bursts of high quality, it's kind of like interval training, you know, they, it turns out like the way I used to go on the treadmill at this turtle's pace, you know, for an hour, like it does nothing, you know, but if you can just like really tune in. Um, it's a bad analogy, but anyway, that's my advice. You know, don't get hung up on, oh, I don't have all afternoon to spend with my child because these are unusual times. But if you can really just like let your child direct the experience for a period of time, it will pay off so much. And you'll end up getting more work done, you know, cause your child like gets that burst of love and they feel important and then they'll be on their way. They don't really want to be with us all the time. It comes out. <laughs> <laughs> One of the many lessons I know, I know. from the shutdown. Great. <laughs> well, Erica, um, I can't believe it, but this concludes the time we have for our conversation. Oh, such today. fun. Thank you very much. I'm so grateful to you for coming and sharing your wisdom and just 
being an all-around awesome human. Thank you for the great questions. And, and I really am so excited to learn more about your school and I, I hope I'll get a chance to see it virtually. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. Great. Um, I learned so much today. So um, we continue to be inspired by your work. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I'm gonna sign off now as we do at the conclusion of every closing circle with children here at Slate School. So we say thank you to everyone and positive rice to you all. Positive rice. And so long from Slade School. Thank Thanks you. Thanks again, everyone. Bye -bye.